Hello, my name is Henrike Hahn, member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA. I am the spokesperson for industrial policy of the German Greens in the European Parliament, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you on the screens on the occasion of this webinar on the carbon contracts for difference, which is crucial, which is a crucial tool to speed up the green transformation of the energy intensive industries. And all the participants will be able to ask questions in the second part of this webinar, so you will be involved as well. And of course, a very warm welcome as to our excellent panel of experts to discuss the very important topic of carbon contracts for difference today. Just some technical details before we start. You will find some house rules posted in the chat box. And we also have translation from English to German and from German to English available. You only have to click at the globe symbol on your screen. Und ich sag's auch nochmal auf Deutsch. Wir haben heute eine Live-Übersetzung von Deutsch auf Englisch und andersherum. Und wer die deutsche Übersetzung aktivieren möchte, muss nur auf das kleine Globus-Symbol auf dem Bildschirm stick, äh, klicken, auf dem Dolmetschen steht. And uh, the audience can ask questions in the Q&A section, which we will try to collect as best as possible and to try to answer in the second part of this webinar. But please feel free to start early with that to begin with. So on the panel, I'm joined today by my very dear colleague, Micha Michael Kellner, Parliamentary State Secretary in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, who is very interested in European affairs since a very long time, as I know, and um, he will give us an update on the status quo of carbon contracts for difference in Germany. I'm looking forward to it. And then we have Alexandre Paco from the European Commission, Director of Innovation for Low Carbon and Resilient Economy in the DG Climate. He will give us a sense on where things stand in the European Commission and how long we will have to wait to see the first European EU CCFD. And then we have Marco Menzing, He is a director general of the European Chemical Industry Council, and he will tell us how CCFDs can help to decarbonize some of the production processes in the chemical industry. And then we also have Axel Eggert. He is director general of the European Steel Association, and he is representing an industry that is immediately associated with the topic of the study, of course. And last, but most, most certainly not least, Mr. Pedro Linares, who among many things is a professor of industrial engineering at the ICAI School of Engineering, and who is one of the authors of the study that I issued about carbon contracts for difference to inform on my work on updating the EU industrial strategy. And we are, of course, I'm very grateful for the study and I'm really, really looking forward to go in all, to, in all these details. Details. And before we dive into this great topic with the presentation of the study by Pedro, let me say a few words to put some context to today's topical debate. So in the light of Putin's war against the Ukraine, the green transformation of the European industry and manufacturing is now even more necessary than ever before. And our dependency on fossil fuel imports is not only translating to high energy prices that are hurting households and the industries, but is actually already leading to a partial shutdown of production. And we need to act faster to implement an ambitious European Green Deal with a strong focus on green industrial policy. We should use the big potential of carbon contracts for difference to immediately trigger the switch to zero emission in highly energy efficient production technologies. And this is one of the crucial elements of the carbon contracts for difference, they should help the industry to make the necessary investments as soon as fast as possible. And I thus welcome the European Commission proposal to use the Innovation Fund for granting such contracts and changing the state aid rules to accommodate national CCFD schemes. So European as well as national carbon contracts for differences can and should coexist because both are needed to fund innovations to bring zero emission technologies to an industrial scale and to support the diffusion 
within the industrial sectors. And for that purpose, we need to address the impact of the EU ETS price with volatility and its potential negative effect on the size of the innovation fund, which could cause problems granting long-term CCFDs. So we should also think about complementary additional recovery and resilience facility type of funding instruments. And in any case, a European approach should allow for sector specific tender designs, meaning tenders for the steel industry, tenders for the chemical industries and others. And it should also focus on the competitiveness of CCFDs and especially support lower income member states to have access to sufficient funding. So we cannot let smaller and less wealthy member states behind in this genera generational challenge. I think this is a very European perspective I have here, and it's definitely necessary to have that in my opinion. And these are very difficult times. We have to fight for a competitive and green industry to have high quality and high paying jobs here in Europe in decades to come. So CCFDs and other state aid instruments cannot solve all the problems we're facing at the moment or all the challenges we are facing, but they can at least contribute by giving investors the long-term security, which is desperately needed. And from my work on the report on updating the EU industrial strategy, which started um, right two days after Putin invaded the Ukraine, I thus issued a study by Pedro Linares and Timo Gerres, who were also working closely together with colleagues from the German Institute of Econ Economic Research to emphasize the importance of those instruments in the transformation pathways of the energy intensive industries. And this is now the perfect uh, hint to the presentation of Pedro Linares. Thank you very much for your wonderful study on this uh, carbon contracts for differences. And I hope it will contribute in a very constructive way on the debates uh, at the European level, as well as the national levels. And dear Pedro, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes and we're looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Enrique. It's a great pleasure to be with you today and to have the opportunity to present this study. Uh, let me share my uh, screen and, and use some slides, mostly as a guidance of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, let me say, as Enrique mentioned, that this is a joint work with a colleague, Timo Garris. Uh, but it's also based on uh, intensive interaction and joint work that we have been having with the uh, CFMP, which is the Climate Friendly Materials Platform. This is a group of researchers and think tanks across Europe, together with uh, convened by climate strategies. Uh, we have been working for the last years to try to help the transformation of industry towards a low carbon competitive one. Uh, so we always say decarbonization without relocation. And uh, during all these years, we have been working on a set of instruments. I'll mention some later. And CCFDs is one of those. Uh, so I would like to thank all my colleagues in the platform for all the very fruitful discussions we have been having. So many of you will already know what is a CSCFD, a uh, carbon contract for differences. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to explain it a bit quite shortly, quite succinctly, given that uh, we only have like 10 minutes. So I'm going to give a basic introduction. I encourage everybody to read the report. And of course, if you have more questions, we are happy to address them and to uh, answer them and to provide you with more materials. So a carbon contract for difference is basically a contract by which two parties engage in order to secure a fixed carbon price over a given term period. So this is basically, an, on, on substance, it is basically a way to secure a fixed carbon price, to hedge against the volatility of the carbon price, which, as you know, can be quite high depending on the period. And, and therefore, particularly for those who are considering an investment in a low carbon technology, to ensure that that low carbon technology will be competitive under this secure, this fixed carbon price. So it helps remove regulatory uncertainty. And to some extent, it also helps cover technological uncertainty. This would be the basic CCFD. But on top of that, we can also add a layer of technology support. That is, instead of just securing the expected carbon price, we can top that up with an additional level of support 
to provide an additional incentive to industry, for example, to address knowledge spillovers or the inherent uncertainty that we have in technology development. So these two elements can be combined into a certain strike price, that is a fixed price, um, that will be compared continuously with the current market price, with the current EU ETS market price. So when the strike price is below the current carbon price, the agent, the industry in this case, would have to give back the difference. But when the strike price is set above the market price, then the government must compensate the uh, industry to, to pay for this difference, therefore to ensure this consistent and constant uh, market price for, sorry, uh, uh, price for, for carbon. Again, this helps the industry ensure that they are going to have a constant source of revenue or a constant source of competitiveness in their carbon uh, market price. Uh, why are these instruments particularly attractive? Well, we think there are basically three elements here. One, it is a very useful commitment device because the government is interested in by engaging in these contracts. Remember my past figure. Uh, the government has to pay whenever the market price is below the strike price, the, the negotiated price. So the government has an inner incentive to keep ETS prices as high as possible or within, of course, certain limits. Uh, therefore, there is an incentive not to try to um, water down the European ETS. And this is a particularly interesting thing. And it also removes the incentive to try to expropriate the rents of innovation. Let me explain that very briefly. What happens if industry starts investing in low carbon technologies? Then the need, the demand for uh, carbon allowances will go down, the market price will go down, and therefore the inventors will, be able, will not be able to uh, recover their investment through the carbon market price. Again, by having this incentive to keep market prices up, we ensure that we have enough innovation incentives for everybody. The second important element is that, as, we, as I already explained, uh, the carbon contract for differences he hedges you against uh, lower carbon price, and it also helps you uh, support particular technologies, depending on uh, the interest in uh, that we have in those technologies for decarbonization, for diffusion of these technologies. And thirdly, uh, by providing a safe, a stable carbon price, it, it reduces the cost of financing those hard, large investments that industry has to make. Um, so that is, of course, a very important uh, element when uh, the changes that we need to transform our industry are strongly based in investment cost and not that much in operation cost, which is the case in most times. It also has an additional social value, which is that it brings back the dynamic efficiency, the constant incentive for innovation that we need in order to decarbonize fully our industry in 2050 as expected in all the European governments or even earlier um, as, as Enrique said in this in this context that we want to decarbonize as fast as possible. Now one thing that I would like to mention is that of course CCFDs are not the silver bullet that will solve industry decarbonization. This has to be combined with it a larger package. Uh, we need more things so for example we need uh, a, a carbon contract for difference will not introduce any incentive for material efficiency, for example, which is also very important if we want to promote the circular economy. This can be uh, achieved, for example, with a climate contribution. Uh, this carbon contract for difference is not addressing, for example, those industries which uh, need to decarbonize larger shares of renewables. Again, here we could use contract for differences for renewables, for renewable power. Uh, if we want to create a larger market, we may need green public uh, procurement or product carbon requirements. So all this has to be integrated within a larger framework in which, of course, CCFDs are going to play a very strong part in terms of reducing the risk associated with the innovation and with the diffusion required to have uh, all these technologies uh, penetrating in our industrial sector. Now, of course, the big question or a big uh, discussion issue is, should this be done at the national level? Should it be done at the European level? And there are 
advantages and disadvantages, of course. Uh, this uh, I should say that this can already be done by member states subject to state aid guidelines, right? Uh, any member state can already use this instrument to help their industry as long as this is uh, consistent with industrial policy guidelines. However, we also need to think that uh, we may have some disadvantages when using this exclusively at the in, at the national level. For example, we may not have an uh, a number of uh, companies competing for these CCFDs large enough, so there may be uh, lack of competitiveness in the allocation of CCFDs, or we can also, uh, if we apply it only at the national level, we may have unfair competition between different member states. Enrique already mentioned that poorer member states will have fewer funds to uh, pay for this CCFD. So if we also want to address solidarity, competitiveness within the European Union, as well as competitiveness within industry in order to get the best options to decarbonize, I think we need a European approach. That European approach can take different shapes from a European uh, managed uh, auction for CCFDs connected, for example, with the Innovation Fund or with a European-based set of guidelines that all countries need to apply to the design of the national CCFDs. So there are different flavors that we can use. And of course, the jury is still out on what is the best approach. But I think the European perspective here is really important. We cannot afford to leave CCFDs just to the national level without any degree of coordination, because that would create a lot of problems. Um, so that would be the basics of CCFD. Then, of course, as you know, the devil is in the details and uh, uh, designing CCFDs correctly uh, will take some time uh, because we can have like fixed uh, uh, prices, variable prices, index prices. For example, in some cases, it might be interested to connect the CCFD price to the gas price because that drives the competitiveness of the low carbon technologies. We can also talk whether those CCFDs should be auctioned or should be negotiated. It all depends on the uh, the number of participants in the industry. Also, some conversation has been had about whether, uh, in principle, CCFDs are two-sided options. As I already explained, when the strike price is higher than the market price, the government will pay the difference. But when the market price is above the strike price, uh, industry will pay the difference. Will some other approaches only consider a one-side option in which only one side pays? We also need to agree on the duration on who has to sign it. And this is also particular, uh, particularly important because although in principle we are thinking about governments being the counterparties here with industry, this is not necessarily the case. We can also have a business-to-business -business, uh, CCFD. This can be uh, engaged by private parties, uh, uh, industry with some demand, for example. And then a very important question is, how do we allocate these CCFDs in terms of sectoral interests? Uh, whether, for example, we have to work on a project-specific basis, where it has to be open to all industry to allow for more competition, we, uh, whether we need to separate industry per maturity pots, for example, so that uh, only technologies who are in the same level of readiness will be able to, to compete for this, right? Another very important element that we need to take care of is the interactions with other policies. For example, the innovation fund. The innovation fund is rather limited in its scope. So uh, it can only apply, for example, for first-of-a-kind plants. But if we want to use CCFDs for broader diffusion, probably the innovation fund is not the right uh, vehicle. We need to think of other vehicles. Another interesting development is the CBAM. Uh, uh, you are all familiar with the development of CBAM of the European Parliament at the European Commission. The CBAM is very important for this because basically uh, if we implement CBAM and we remove free allocation, this is going to change the way in which we have to design CCFDs because CCFDs, what we are doing is we are ensuring a fixed price for all the extra allowances that now industry is not going to need because they have moved to a low carbon alternative. Now, if they don't have the free allowances, they cannot sell anything. 
So we have to change a bit the design of the CCFD uh, because now the, the vehicle will have to be different. Also, of course, the CCFDs are very much connected with the ETS because they're a function of the ETS price and they are very much connected with free allocation. So these are all elements that we need to take care of when designing the uh, the CCFD. Now, uh, of course, uh, the, the last question that I think is inevitable is, um, uh, do, do we still need CCFDs in the current energy crisis that is increasing gas prices and therefore is making low carbon options more competitive? We think there is still space and there is still a need for CCFDs because we don't think that this crisis, in spite of the gas prices, are um, are incentivizing investment because basically what we have is a volatility, volatility crisis which creates a lot of uncertainty and this uncertainty is not helping for investment. So if we want to bring back certainty, if we want to bring back uh, security for investors, I think CCFDs are going to provide a very important tool here. Although, of course, they can be indexed to gas prices to, to minimize the expenses required. And that's all I wanted to say. I hope I stick to the 10 minutes allocated. And of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you very much, dear Pedro. Uh, that was very interesting and full of details, of course, but very relevant. And then I will give the floor to Micha Kellner, who will tell us about when we can expect German CCFDs and how they will look like. And uh, maybe also you could say some words about the importance of these instruments for the industrial policy strategy of the German government, if applied. So dear Micha, uh, looking forward to your thoughts as well. Thanks. Uh, Enrique, thank you, uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you for a very, this very interesting study. You asked about the importance, and I will say, uh, as as perspective of the of the German government, uh, we will take some emergency measurements um, according to the temporary crisis framework of the European Union to stabilize um, gas prices and. Um, um, energy prices at all. And we'll do that in, in next year till 2024. But it's clear that, um, you know, being Europe a strong, with a strong industrial base, we need to get these prices down. We need to get um, power price, electricity prices down. And um, therefore these uh, carbon contracts uh, for differences are one important instrument. Let me say it's not an only uh, instrument. Uh, we already heard some instruments, but you also will have uh, PPAs. Uh, we uh, we are working on uh, green uh, industrial um, electricity prices, but the CCFDs are in a way important on a long term perspective. And uh, the government compensates the additional costs of uh, climate friendly production processes compared with the con uh, conventional production um, processes by giving a grant to the company. And the idea is, you know, having OPEX um, stabilized for a period of time. And um, in the coalition talks uh, last year, we agreed to establish and uh, conclude uh, CCFDs and earmark the budget uh, of uh, around 20 billion euro for this purpose. And um, the German Ministry of Economics and Climate uh, Action have been working uh, on the design of the funding program of these contracts together with forward 20 experts. Uh, companies and other stakeholders uh, were able to give their input in, in May this year. Uh, based on this, a draft of a funding guideline has been prepared and uh, we are just currently finalizing. It's, uh, and uh, Paolo, we started already talks with the EU Commission, and uh, we will hope that we have a, a notification procedure, um, hopefully um, finished uh, by, by February 2023. So that's, uh, Enrique, your question um, about the timetable. So we hope that uh, in the first quarter of uh, 2023, the first climate uh, protection contracts can be concluded. So it's an, an ambitious 
a timetable, but you know, uh, we, we try it. Um, but um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there, there are more than one instrument for sure to limited uh, financial resources and um, and we only will be able to you know to have certain uh, certain amount of agreements with a limited number of companies and uh, therefore we, we probably will include um, include certain industrial branches like like steel chemicals glass cement uh, and so there will be there will be some restrictions in a way we're thinking about how it works in a standard case companies uh, can offer a price avoiding a ton of uh, co2 through climate friendly production and the company that uh, bids uh, the lowest price and those saves most co2 most efficiently will be awarded, awarded uh, the contract um and then it's important as as we just heard um and i will i will i will underline that i mean the price is also linked to the co2 price or the price for h2 right and so we will have a design to 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 um not not to or to avoid strong over or uh, strong under subsidies so uh, therefore we map it in, in both directions um towards the co2 uh the co2 price um and there will be of course um there will be of course obligations uh, within these uh, climate uh, protection contract otherwise it wouldn't be a contract right uh, so um, there must be first of all reporting obligations some kind of uh, transparency uh, so that we can calculate uh, the, uh, the payments and uh, so we have um, we have uh, standard uh, standardized uh, extensive transparency obligations to detect also breaches of course and if there would be breaches i hope not there would be also the the possibility of um sanctions so that's the basic idea we are working on and i hope i i gave you in in that few remarks and some insights what we are planning what our timetable is and um I'm very much looking forward to implement that. I think it's, it would be a huge step forward to, you know, to come along with uh, climate friendly uh, production processes. So I think it's really important uh, that we are able to, to make that work. Thank you very much, dear, dear Micha. Um, I really appreciate your thoughts here. I um, I heard that you are still with us uh, till um, 4.45. So we have mm -hmm. a chance, um, maybe if you are quick with our other um, experts, um, or are rather precise to, to go into the discussion again as well. But first of all, uh, we come also to uh, Mr. Alexander Baku. Thank you very much for being with us today. The Commission is playing a key role for the availability of carbon contracts for differences throughout Europe. And um, so we are glad if you tell us what the situation is in DG climate and how important this topic is for the current Commission. And when, when we will see the first EU CCFD and how will it look like, uh, I would like to ask you that question as well in a, a wonderful, smiling way. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Henrique, and uh, good afternoon, uh, dear dear colleagues. Yes, very happy to be invited to your um, panel. I think it's extremely timely. I think you said it all, uh, Henrique, in your introduction that we are facing this uh, climate and uh, energy crisis. And as part of the solutions, the answers to that, uh, we clearly need to decarbonize uh, industry. Uh, and for that, uh, we need legislation, we need targets, but we also need uh, financial uh, support, technology support. And I think uh, the presentation from Pedro was extremely interesting, also giving the, the, the broader picture. We, we are here focusing our attention on, on carbon contract for difference, but I think 
we need to keep in mind uh, the other type of instruments which can uh, really uh, very much support uh, the, the needed transition to uh, decarbonize uh, industry. And as part of that, uh, I think several speakers already mentioned the innovation fund. Um, I think we are all quite big uh, fan of this fund. It is about uh, 40 billion euros uh, recycled from the revenues of ETS and going back to industry to decarbonize. Uh, and this money needs to be spent on the best possible way. And this is uh, what we are doing. And uh, we have been doing it uh, through uh, grants. This has been, I would say, the main way to deliver uh, the support to industry through grants for uh, large scale uh, projects, uh, first of a kind uh, demonstration projects. And uh, last uh, week, actually, uh, or two weeks ago, we launched the third call for 3 billion euros. Uh, and for the first time, this call uh, is, has very specific windows looking in particular at uh, supporting electrification and hydrogen in industry for, for more than 1 billion euros, but also looking at the whole value chain, because I think here, we really have to keep in mind that uh, we want to uh, support industry to decarbonize, but we also want to create innovation in Europe and to have uh, the value chain uh, in Europe and to support also the uh, component, component uh, manufacturers. When we talk about hydrogen, for instance, uh, having a production of uh, the most innovative uh, uh, electrolysis taking place in Europe, for instance. So with the uh, innovation fund and this third uh, large scale school, we are really targeting also uh, the innovation in this uh, in this value in this value chain. So now, uh, this, be beyond this aspect of, of grants, which are absolutely necessary, in particular for this, I would say, most innovative projects, we need to be uh, supported for for becoming uh, commercially viable. Uh, we are also looking at other type of uh, what we call competitive bidding mechanism and uh, carbon contract for difference is, is one of them. Uh, why are we looking at that? Because uh, we see many advantages for such uh, instruments. First, this is a very cost effective way in distributing financial supports. And I think we had very good uh, success stories uh, in the field of uh, renewable power. Um, but also with such type of instrument, we will allow for very transparent price discovery. So we will know what is the true real price of a particular a technology of a particular new, new product. And that's, I would say, a better way than having, uh, let's say, uh, officials in a building deciding you know, what is the best uh, price for a particular product. But here, with this competitive bidding, we're really looking at uh, making uh, price discovery uh, and market formation. And also, uh, thirdly, we see these instruments as very powerful to de-risk uh, investments. And I think it was already said uh, previously, uh, we need investment to happen and industry will invest if they see very much uh, a very clear and certain uh, way uh, to environments uh, to, to provide them certainty for, for investing. And this instrument will also help to really leverage as much private uh, capital as, as possible. So for all these good reasons, and I think Pedro already mentioned uh, many of them, uh, we see this competitive bidding as a very, uh, would say, promising instrument. And uh, we have been proposing to amend the ETS directive so that the innovation fund is not only used, as Pedro was saying, for a first of a kind project, but also for uh, uh, deploying and upscaling uh, uh, projects uh, through, throughout, throughout Europe. And I hear, as I hear also, I heard several of the speakers already talking about the European dimension. Uh, probably we can speak about it in a, in a minute, but with the innovation, we really bring truly a European perspective uh, to, this, uh, to this instrument. So we made this proposal by the, revise, by the revision of the ETS. This is now up for discussion in the co-decision. So I hope we will very soon have uh, the green light from uh, the co-legislator to uh, really uh, make that uh, in practice. Uh, then secondly, uh, with the Repower EU, uh, there was a clear commitment by the commission to uh, really launch this competitive bidding through a contract for difference for hydrogen, for green hydrogen. And I will come back to that in a minute. Um, 
But also, um, you know, that uh, our president made clear in the State of the Union speech that uh, she wants to see an hydrogen bank uh, in Europe. And with the Innovation Fund and this competitive bidding, we will have one element of the domestic leg uh, of, this, uh, of this bank. And why I'm now talking about uh, contract for difference, while I think the title of the conference is Carbon Contract for Difference. And I think maybe just one minute of element to uh, indicate that basically these are very similar instruments, but the main difference is that with the contract for difference, the reference price is the product itself. So here, basically uh, the price of, of, of hydrogen, so fossil hydrogen would be the, the, the reference price, while for the carbon contract for difference, the carbon price uh, would be the, the reference price. But basically we see that as very much uh, two sides of the of the safe, uh, same coin. Now, why why are we starting our pilot phase with uh, with hydrogen and not other green products? And I'm sure we heard we will hear from Axel and, and Marco in a minute that there are also many other type of green products which could be supported by such type of instruments. Uh, basically, in our analysis, we see that hydrogen and green hydrogen plays a key role because to decarbonize uh, either steel or chemicals we would need uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen. And this is a bulk of the additional costs. And this is why we want to start uh, with, with looking at, uh, at uh, hydrogen. Now, uh, Henrik, uh, you, you asked me, wh where do we stand? So where, when can we have these first uh, calls and auctioning to, to happen? First, uh, we need to have the legal framework in place. So this is our top priority. Secondly, and I think Pedro said it right, uh, the, the devil is, in the details, so we need to get these first auctions right. And there are many uh, design elements which need to be decided open. And we are currently carrying out a very thorough public consultation. We had uh, at the end of October, a workshop with 120 participants from academia, think tank, member states. We have on Monday, a workshop with more than 600 uh, people really going to help us to design uh, in the best possible way this first uh, is for auction. So it will take a bit of time, but we want to do it right. It is uh, first time uh, we will uh, launch such type of, uh, of, uh, of initiative, of new instruments. So we are, I would say, we need also to look at what is happening uh, elsewhere and the experience in Germany and in the UK will be extremely uh, helpful. And let me conclude by uh, saying that, of course, for doing that as part of the Innovation Fund, we need a, a good size for the Innovation Fund. And uh, currently, big discussion in the co-legislator about the size of the Innovation Fund. So this is still uh, up for discussion. Also the discussion regarding the Repower EU and whether part of the Innovation Fund would contribute to the Repower EU uh, financing. So still many open issues, but we hope that very soon we have clarity and we can really start, I would say, uh, the work on the actual auctioning. So this uh, panel is a very timely panel and uh, looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Alexandre. That, that was very, very interesting. And I'm sure you will also get a lot of questions from our audience and other panelists in the open discussion. And please, dear audience, um, at the screens, uh, feel free to uh, post your questions already in the chat because then we can see that in time. And of course, we cannot discuss this topic without the input of the industry, which is why I'm very happy to have two important industries represented here today. Mr. Menzing represents the EU chemical industry and will tell us about the relevance and also the things that need to be considered in designing CCFDs for the chemical sectors. Thanks for being with us today. And also thanks, I guess, I think you have still a couple of minutes, dear Michael Kellner, um, to listen to us. But we are very grateful as well that you're here and to listen to your perspectives. And um, dear Mr. Menzing, so you have the floor for another eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Enrique, if you allow me with Michael still here. <clears throat> I'll use one minute to say, don't fight the IRA, but copy as much as you can. Um, not only looking at the Brits, but also at the Americans. That's a debate where I'm gonna end up as well, but lots of interesting developments in the US where investing in carbon becomes a business model, which is something that we're working towards in this, um, in this scheme as well. 
Um, a small remark as well that some people have commented that I'm wearing a hoodie on quite an official meeting as a CEFIC Director General. But as I told you, the climate conference brought me a lot of good things, but also a positive COVID test. So forgive me for my hoodie and not a, a suit and a tie coming in from, uh, from home. The reason I still wanted to be here is the importance of the, uh, the topic, that's clear. If you look at chemicals, um, let me split it clearly. There's about 29,000 chemical companies in Eurostat. There's 11,000 of a certain size that are our members in Germany, Vautzi's members, for example. And there's of course all the big household names you know, which is about 70 companies who are in our membership. Now, why mentioning that? Because the issues at the table um, are not only where the big companies invest, but especially in the German context, if we can make the forestand of the middle stands move forward and also survive with the current energy crisis, they're the ones most impacted, where some of our global companies actually still have solutions overseas to, uh, to balance their results. If you look at those groups um, and at the technologies at hand, electrification is going to be crucial, and that's where we're equal to steel. Electrification indirectly through hydrogen brings a competition for electrons, something to note as well, and an infrastructure question on pipelines on electricity um, as much as anything else. Now, what we have in CEFIC is a IC2050 model where we can make multiple roadmaps from today to zero by changing the electricity price, the hydrogen price, and working on a complete model of the industry, learn from those pathways towards 2050. And you see the electric cracker will come by 2030. You see the relevance of renewable methanol. You see the relevance of large heat pumps coming in, but you also see that the price and the cost levels, even before the war, were not competitive enough always to have the investment be made here. And that's the point I'd like to raise. That's the joint interest that Axel Eggert and myself have, which is it's not only to invent it, but it's invest in it and invest in it in Europe, which is the key puzzle we need to break. Now with Axel um, from the steel sector, we worked along for a long time. We're all timers in the ETS, but we worked on IPCEIs, one model to also still look into the project of common European interest. We had the high level round table on energy intensive industries, which already listed the carbon contracts for difference as an option. And we were at the start of the innovation fund where that's indeed, as Alexander said, the tool everyone is happy with and where you see large chemical projects come forward. Maybe a critical remark. Um, the first innovation fund was 1 billion and there were 21 billion of projects submitted. And that's where if I see CCFD money will float out of the innovation fund, it hurts me a bit on the inside. I would hope we would get it next to the innovation fund and very much fund it from something else than where already a good use of the money should be. If you look at the um, different tools and the different tools in the mix, there is a clear role for the CCFDs. So we're very interested in it. We have a number of technical remarks. And one of it is that you see most of the innovations in our sector will depend on OPEX issues, not necessarily CAPEX being the, the first uh, as such. And the inclusion of feedstock and fossil commodities in this striking price will become relevant. It's not just carbon alone. So it's gonna be a more complex one. I appreciate um, Mrs. Hahn's remark to maybe look at sectoral applications. I would still link it to what the climate law said, which asked for sectoral climate roadmaps, which so far we haven't seen much move on, but which could be combined in this case. And for that reason, CEFIC and the chemical industry very much drive on what is now called a transition pathway in the ecosystem of energy intensive industries under the industrial policy of Mr. Breton. Um, this is Binglish, Brussels English, not necessarily English, but transition pathway or sexual climate roadmap or sexual application of CCFDs. I think it all goes in the, in the same direction. So positive attitude on the chemical industry side. I think also in cooperation with steel with lots of overlap and you'll see that Axel Eggert in a minute will, will take over in a, in a similar fashion as I do, but maybe just the one philosophical remark. 
We've seen the noise on the US IRA. We see that, and this is a political one, we might actually choose to support Mr. Biden on helping reduce emissions and not attack him. We also see that it's a very profitable business model what the US is building for its industry to invest in low carbon emissions. That's something where we have to pay proper attention because still with the positiveness of CCFD, we take money out of industry, it's put in an innovation fund, then we take it out of the innovation fund, and then parts of all the money taken out of industry will come back, which is a fundamentally different model than what the US is applying, where with the tax breaks, you get an accelerator. So if we study the CCFDs, we'd be really interested to apply it to the front runners because that's what we're talking about get the front running investments to europe but also think through what not the laggards but the middle pack the large mass of industry that needs to transform how we can get solutions there because for that large group actually these tools would be unaffordable and the state wouldn't have enough money to do so so this kind of reflection on the total economic system around the ccfd i think will help us in in a good design as well but overall, um, thank you very much for doing this on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thanks for pushing a tool that can help our companies for the one and last line I will repeat. It's in my interest, your interest, our interest, that this new technology actually comes to Europe and the first of a kind is built here. And as long as we share that dream, then we're in good shape. Thank you, Ms. Han. Thank you very much, dear Marco Menzink, uh, for your perspective, uh, including um, the chemical industry perspective. And uh, we will now jump to our second industry representative, who I heard also used to work for some years in the European Parliament. And Mr. Eckert, we are very happy that you could join us today as well. And as I said in the beginning, CCFDs are closely associated with the needs of the steel industry as well. So please give us your take on the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Henrique. Uh, so thanks also for the invitation. And uh, the report, I believe, is uh, very useful. I think it's a success, uh, this report. It uh, includes um, all the elements uh, which we are talking about. And therefore, it provides a very good basis uh, for further uh, thought and implementation uh, of uh, CFDs. Uh, CFDs is a crucial issue for our industry. And uh, therefore, I would like uh, to, to show you why the urgency in our industry is so uh, huge for such a tool. And I have only one slide to present to you uh, to demonstrate that uh, the European steel industry is working since 2003 uh, on uh, projects and they are now ready to be implemented at industrial scale. We have currently 60 projects, uh, large scale projects um, running uh, to be implemented uh, before 2030. Uh, and uh, the potential CO2 abatement uh, of those uh, projects is 80 2 million tons of CO2. That is more than one third of the entire emissions of our industry. This is really huge. Uh, and it is um, around about 2% of the entire CO2 emissions of the European Union. Uh, so of course, um, there is a huge need in terms of capital investment, uh, but also the operational costs uh, are the biggest question mark actually. And if you see here on the slide, uh, 54 billion uh, euros operational cost that is pre energy crisis uh, estimations um, uh, we will need uh, only for these projects by 2030 165 terawatt hours of electricity uh, and the more than half of that would be used for the production uh, of hydrogen and of course uh, this electricity should be uh, low carbon or carbon neutral um, and uh, there comes uh, the urgency and also then uh, thanks for the uh, Mr. Kellner that you have um, done the work in Germany to put this into place um, next year, because this is really time timely. Uh, th these projects have started uh, partially, they need to be implemented by 2025. We have the first a blast furnace being um, switched over to new technologies, for example, direct reduced iron with electric arc furnace uh, technology, where we can use uh, hydrogen, for example. And uh, these technologies 
enable us to become almost completely carbon neutral uh, by 2050 or even before for uh, depending on the supply uh, with uh, clean uh, electricity and, and hydrogen. So it's really urgent that we have these tools tools to de-risk this, uh, this in, uh, investment. So that is the first point. It's uh, the urgency. Uh, the second point which I wanted to make uh, is uh, that there needs to be sufficient financial resources. I think that has been just discussed before. Uh, the Innovation Fund itself uh, is providing um, funding and we fully support uh, the commission here and the EU institutions to also provide uh, funding uh, for CFDs, but it's too small. And uh, we are also of the opinion that yes, national funding is important, but EU funding needs to be scaled up at the same time. It was mentioned, I think, by Henrique in the beginning of uh, the meeting that we need also some member states where uh, there are less uh, capacity to to make this investment uh, to support them. Um, the third point uh, is um, that now I, I just want to um, add to what Marco has said on the uh, US Inflation Reduction Act, um, which again shows the urgency of such uh, such a, a measure. Uh, we are our companies are now thinking where to invest and this is really concrete and, and the, uh, the us inflation reduction act uh, is um, something where more where a lot of certainty for the companies is provided uh, where they can um, calculate already whether they have a business case or not we need this type of certainty in europe as well and very soon and the contracts for difference is such a tool which can provide that uh, the third point i wanted to make is the the target um, of which sectors uh, should be targeted and then of course those which have uh, the most potential to reduce co2 in huge volumes and the steel industry and the chemical industry are such examples um, but uh, also uh, and i think marco mentioned that uh, there should be a sectoral approach it would not be good now to compute compete uh, between sectors. So that could also lead to a situation where in the one sector we will see investment, but not in the other, and that should be avoided. Um, so the fourth point uh, is that uh, we agree with the variable strike price. Uh, that means indexation of certain components uh, of the CDF, um, uh, CFD. Uh, but uh, it should uh, not only concern, I think in the report, uh, Coking coal is mentioned, uh, but it's very important also to uh, to consider energy and raw materials. Energy you have just spoken, that is the big question mark uh, for uh, all energy intensive industries. Uh, we do not know what the price will be from today's perspective, the price is too high. So that needs definitely also to be tackled within um, CFDs for, for the industry. Uh, and the last point, um, uh, or no, the, um, including in that is that we need uh, a strike price that covers the full effective abatement cost gap between CO2 low steel and conventional steel. So only that would provide a business case. Uh, on the other hand, it needs, of course, to be clearly um, uh, clearly fixed that there should not be any type of over subsidization. We agree to that. Uh, one example is, um, uh, if the reduce, uh, if uh, reducing the aid by the CO2 price, so for example, 100, if the CO2 price is 100 euros and a ton of steel costs uh, uh, in its production 600 euros, so together with the CO2 cost is 100 euros. So if we simply reduce the CO2 price, uh, then we will still have an uncompetitive price of the product. So that needs to be uh, considered here. Of course, there needs to be made the balance between free allocation and the real carbon costs uh, of uh, per ton of steel or per operation. Uh, and the last point is um, that uh, CFDs uh, should be allowed to cover the entire period of the investment. And that is in the steel industry, but also in other energy intensive industries uh, up to 20 years, depending on, on the projects. And if you compare the support which have, has been uh, given to renewables since 2007, that we are talking about 700 billion euros. 
and uh, for the energy intensive industries, therefore there should also um, uh, sufficient support in terms of, uh, of financing uh, and um, also on uh, with regard to a sufficient long period. I think I stop here and uh, hopefully we will have a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Axel Eggert. I really appreciate it. And I think we have the chance now um, to make a short round of all the panelists to respond to the interventions of their co panelists So if you have still something in mind, um, this is the place to, to say it and to comment in. So maybe if you're still here with us, uh, dear Michael Kellner, I would um, put you first here, then we have a short reaction from your part. That would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. I do have to run, but I was interested uh, to, to hear to hear what uh, Mr. Mensing and uh, Mr. Eggert had, had to say. Please apologize me, but I have to be in the next meeting and I have to run. But I, it was very valuable insights uh, as uh, from the report. Uh, thanks, Henrika, what what you did, and thanks thanks to your comments, uh, Mr. Eggert and Mr. Mensing. And, and just let me add. Um, very well aware um, that we also see some development in the US, I will put it in a more diplomatic way. And um, it's uh, really from uttermost importance uh, for us to come forward um, with um, measurements like uh, CCFDs to, to be have a competitive environment and getting rid of uh, CO2 emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being, being with us. <coughs> Pardon, we really appreciate it. And then, dear Mr. Alexandre Paco, maybe you have something to add here on this time. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's the, the first, uh, I would say, panel uh, interventions were extremely, I would say, uh, helpful because they, they show the, the clear willingness, both from the side of the public. Uh, sector and the side from industry to, uh, I would say, invest strongly in this type of instrument, because we see the, the powerful uh, result that they can have. Uh, we see also the complexity of them. Uh, I think there are still um, uh, many elements that we still need to look at in terms of the design to do it right. Uh, but we also see uh, the big potential it has. I also take good note of what uh, Axel and Marco were, were saying about uh, the size of this uh, intervention. That needs to be a sizable intervention. Um, and that brings me again to this issue of, you know, at the level of the European intervention, how big the innovation fund will be. Uh, and I think, as I said, this is still uh, uh, open for, for debate in the, in the co-legislators uh, process. And uh, we, we truly hope that uh, there will be sufficient, I would say, funding uh, to, to really carry out this, uh, this initiative with a real, uh, I would say, added value. Um, and I also take very good note that this is not the only instrument that it should be seen in combination with other instruments, other intervention, be at national level. Also, industry will have a key role to play. Um, so I think we can really go hand in hand through this uh, transition pathway, as Marco was saying to really uh, support this transition and make it a success. So uh, I think this was a very, very useful, uh, I would say, first exchange of views. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, um, dear Marco Menzing, do you have immediate reactions to your co-panelists and all the uh, opinions we just heard? Thank you. Absolutely. Besides that, it's a cool panel. So thank, thank you for that. Um, you know, maybe two points to raise. Um, the one thing I did not completely get from Pedro in the report is that I don't think there's a relation between CCFD and the intention of governments to keep the carbon price high or not. Um, I'm one of the few people who's not very impressed with carbon market traders because it's really easy in a market which gets down by a factor every year. Um, so you know the price will go up. There might be a temporary itch in between, but it, uh, it will go up. Now, that high carbon price is needed for us also to defend the investments to our CEOs. And that's, I think, the, the, the really time pressure we're now in. We had a number of these large projects, and Axel showed them as well, lined up, prepared, thought through, going through the innovation fund. And with the current energy crisis um, being discussed again at global head offices, because 
We don't think this energy crisis is here for this winter, but probably three to five years, if you read it well, which brings the question on the European competitiveness overall. So any good news we can give of new designs or new means to guarantee to the global investment community that the next project will actually not only survive, but be in the money and then be able to stand on its own feet, because that's going to be important. It cannot be lifelong support. Um, I think is is very important. It's the um, the signal that the IRA gave to the global investment world, as much as the content. And I think we can have the same here. On the the um, innovation fund, I'm gonna remain my stubborn. Um, don't take money from there. Take it from elsewhere, uh, or add it to it, because all the money in the innovation fund will will need definitely to get things going. On hydrogen, maybe for Alexandra, um, coming out of the COP, you saw the, the boost on green hydrogen. Pretty much every stand in Egypt was about green hydrogen. And you saw also Ursula von der Leyen sign a number of agreements. Green hydrogen, um, absolutely the way to go, but the price has to come down. Um, it's still way more expensive than the gray hydrogen already on site and, and in our processes. And if CCFDs can help there, I think that's a big step forward. So thanks, Mrs. Han, over to you. Thank you very much. And then uh, dear Axel Eggert, do you have an immediate reaction as well? I was already the last speaker, so I could already uh, react uh, some somewhat. Uh, one thing is very important. Uh, we as the European steel industry, but also other sectors, but steel is exporting 20 million tons uh, of steel. Uh, we are importing 30 million tons uh, of steel every year. Uh, so we are uh, in fierce competition with other uh, industries, uh, um, steel companies around the globe. And therefore we need uh, to make sure that uh, there is also not a, um, a disadvantage for our products, which we put uh, on the global market. There's a huge discussion right now on exports under the CBAM. Uh, I hope there will be found a, um, a, a a good way forward for that because um, we risk that we really uh, destroy our market with our own products if we, they do not find a place in the global market and we also at the same time we want to export green steel so we need to think about uh, how can we do that we have if you have um, a difference in price of 200 or 300 euros on the global market with the green steel we will not find anyone buying it. So what we can solve with the CFDs here um, uh, in the transition, maybe uh, more a challenge even on the global market, but we have to find solutions for that. Uh, and then uh, on the internal market, it is very important uh, that we, with such tools, and it has been said, there is a, a whole set of tools, but the CFDs, will contribute to creating a market for green steel in, in Europe. And once we have a first sustainable market for green steel, green chemicals uh, in Europe, um, that means a certain share of green products in the market, then we can also think about other measures. And I'm thinking about standards, for example, where the most CO2 in intensive products will be cut off the European market. So that would also create then um, new uh, market fields for, for the European steel industry where they can substitute these uh, high CO2 uh, intensive products with uh, European production on our own market. Thank you very much. And then uh, we come uh, to Pedro Linares. Thank you very much, dear Pedro, for stimulating this wonderful discussion we have just because of you and your wonderful study. Um, <laughs> For all of us, you, if you want to reread the study, you can find it on my homepage, of course. Uh, but of course, now we are very interested in your thoughts or reactions to the panelists. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to hear that everybody is interested in this instrument. This is, uh, it, it gives us a lot of satisfaction of, of being on, working on this. And, and as I said, within the platform, we have been working on this for, for quite a time. Uh, I just wanted to use a couple of minutes to maybe comment on a couple of issues that have been raised. One is the connection with the innovation funds and, and the uh, the volumes needed to to fund the CCFD. Um, I would like to uh, remind something I, I mentioned very briefly, which is that CCFDs can actually be used in two flavors, right? One flavor, which would be mostly 
apply to first of a kind or pilot projects would be the kind in which we are hedging the risk. And on top of that, we are providing some support to compensate for innovation market failures, right? Uh, that that would might be the, the vehicle uh, through which we allocate the funds in the innovation fund. But then, of course, the concern is, okay, how do we make the innovation fund bigger to uh, apply the CCFD to diffusion? That is not a first of a kind, but to the extension of these technologies. And here, the comment I would like to make is that for the diffusion, maybe the level of support we need is not that high. Maybe what we need is to de-risk the investments, as has been mentioned. And de-risking the investments is not that costly because actually what we are paying for here is for a warranted price, which might very well be the expected price in the market. Right. What we are doing is we are providing certainty to the investors that this is going to happen. And so I think we what we would need to do maybe is to have an estimation of the volume needed for both flavors and then see how they can fit within the innovation fund or without or outside the innovation fund. Because, of course, we need both and we will need everything to, to push for the decarbonization. But maybe what we don't need to do is to put everything into into the same box, right? And um, then, of course, uh, there have been also some mentions about the risking OPEX. Uh, I, in my presentation, I'll, I only mentioned CAPEX, but of course, OPEX also can be the risk. And, and here, indexing is a good way to, to risk OPEX. Um, somebody in the audience also mentioned about dynamic strike prices. Uh, for example, when indexing CCFDs, uh, just to mention that the coking call uh, was just an example. Of course, we need to understand which are the drivers behind the, the cost of the different technologies, and we can index to several of these raw materials or energy sources. Um, um, dynamic strike prices may also be interested, but remember that dynamic strike prices need to be uh, known beforehand. Because basically, if not, we are not risking anything, right? So when we talk about dynamic, we need to be very careful. I mean, of course, it could be escalating or, or uh, following different patterns, but they need to be known in advance so that we are able to de-risk. And uh, following maybe Mr. Mensing's comment that uh, pr carbon prices will only go up, of course, uh, that's what we all expect as the ratchet is pushed. But but then, of course, uh, the thing is, there is always, uh, I, I don't know in your countries, but for example, in my country right now, there is this discussion about deactivating the ETS to protect customers. Uh, so there is always the temptation for some member states to kind of relax the ETS whenever there is some concern about competitiveness. If, if governments or uh, at the national or European level know that when relaxing the ETS, they're also going to have to pay more through the CCFD. Well, maybe they think twice. So, of course, this is not like the first uh, element that should be considered when uh, implementing a CCFD, but I think it's a welcome feature. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, for your summary and, and all your details here on that. And um, I think we have seen in the discussion chat already that we have uh, received uh, lots of questions as well from the audience. So feel free to post them and to continue to post them. And even if we, we try to bundle them, of course, today here, and um, maybe we could also answer them uh, a little later on right after that webinar. But first of all, I received, uh, for example, a very interesting question to Alexandre Paco uh, from Nicolas uh, Baglin. Um, he is asking the EU pushes for moving the industry from fossil fuels, natural gas to renewable electricity and hydrogen as illustrated by the third call of the innovation fund. And priority will be given in that part of the call to most major projects like the ones that will least, least need CCFD. So do you agree with this statement? So, dear, Alex uh, dear Alexander, maybe you have an immediate reaction to that. Thanks. Yes, uh, I think it's it's truly correct that uh, with this third uh, call, we are really uh, trying to provide uh, some some big, uh, I would say, 
volume of, of grants for uh, first of a kind projects in the field of, of industry uh, for hydrogen and electrification. And we truly hope that uh, there will be a very you know, interesting project. And having heard uh, what Axel and, and, and Marco were saying, it's, it is very promising. We also have a, a very large uh, project pipeline. Uh, we know that there are many projects uh, very much coming in Europe. Um, and uh, with this uh, call, we will expect to really select uh, the most promising ones uh, based on, on, on excellence. Um, and the ones which will really provide, uh, I would say, the best in terms of uh, also scalability in the future. Huh? That's uh, also an important element uh, that we want to, to support project based on a number of criteria, but one of them is the, the, the technical and financial maturity of the project so that they can be re replicated also uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, so yes, this is uh, the part of grants that we are providing uh, with this uh, third call. Uh, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but with the uh, contract for difference, uh, we go one step beyond because we are really looking with this uh, hydrogen uh, pilot uh, that we want to, to, to launch and also uh, supporting the production of hydrogen and also looking very much as the OPEX uh, element of the, of, the, of, the, of the picture. Because uh, we've heard also from Marco and, Ax and Axel that uh, having availability of uh, green, uh, hydrogen, which is competitive compared to uh, fossil based hydrogen, is absolutely critical to decarbonize and, electrif and electrify uh, industry. So uh, we see very much a combination of the two. And I think it goes hand in hand with what Pedro was saying support first of a kind project, but also uh, support uh, project uh, deployment, upscaling, and production of hydrogen, green hydrogen will need support uh, because uh, I think Marco was saying it as well, uh, the costs of producing a renewable uh, hydrogen is, is very high. Um, so we will need somehow to compensate uh, this difference of cost. And the contract for difference is a very uh, strong instrument for that. It brings clarity, certainty for investment. And I think this is uh, what, what industry is, uh, is looking uh, for. So I think we, we will have a good a good combination of, of the two now. What exactly should be the level and the envelope needed? We are also looking at that. And Pedro, any work you're doing uh, is, of course, very, very interesting and welcome. And this is why we are having all this discussion with stakeholders to collect as much as information about project, about uh, cost developments, uh, about um, you know, prospect uh, about uh, maturity of, of, of technologies, and this will really help us to shape the best possible uh, programs in the in the coming years. Thank you very much, and uh, let me just jump in with an own question as well to um, Marco Menzik, uh, because the, I think that's an interesting uh, perspective as well to hear it from the industry as well. Um, so according to your opinion, which should be the condition required to be granted a CCFD. Also, you know, if you look at the perspective um, from, um, from uh, political actors, not only the industry, but just the other way around, or maybe we could compromise on that. And do you think that CCFDs could trigger investments in recycling or circularity and how? That would be very interesting too. Thanks. Yeah, interesting question. Um... First of all, we're just talking scope one and two right now. And scope three is the next big thing if it's not already a big thing. Um, and you'll see that a lot of the emissions overall in our industries are in scope three, are downstream in the value chains. Where also I think a next debate with Pedro would be interesting to see how the, the whole value chain impact works out. They'll be curious to learn. Um, if you look at our modeling in IC 2050, we can double the amount of biomass, for example, but that's from 10 to 20%. And then you run into all kinds of boundaries, hydrogen and electrification, but recycling and using waste as a feedstock is absolutely one of the routes we want to pursue. Um, quoting the former director general of, uh, of ECA, who said, waste is nothing else than a chemical mixture. We just need to regain the chemicals again. Now, that means investing in recycling. Um, if it brings a, a technology that has a, a positive balance for the climate as well, for me, should be eligible. But maybe before the more philosophical question, 
more and more we should direct our aid to those people who actually do invest in Europe um, and also have a few commitments around it for investments in Europe. I think that's a, that's the second one. So not only the design of the technology, but making absolutely clear that the plant is and stays and operates for quite some time would be a criterion to get those, uh, those support. Um, and if not, you might have to give it back. Thank you very much for, for your answer here. And um, I've seen in the audience uh, a question from Mario Hüttenhofer to Pedro. I would like to read for you. Um, he's saying, most important seems to me the process to define the strike price. It should reflect public interest to not over subsidize industry. And on the other side, the CAPEX risk needs to be shared. However, I think the investment cannot be fully protected and also some kind of dynamic strike price is needed because the ETS mechanism per se causes an increasing price of certificates, which favors the investor. So what kind of dynamic is most useful here? This is asking Mario Hüttenhofer to Pedro. Do you have, dear Pedro, do you have an answer to that? Yeah, um, I mean, of course, I agree that uh, defining the strike price is a very relevant problem. Um, as for the comment on the dynamic strike price and also the evolution of ETS prices, uh, I, I think I partially answered that before. Uh, so uh, the thing is, on the one hand, we need to discuss uh, or we need to uh, get a better idea of what is going to happen with ETS prices. And we have already mentioned the fact that they may be going up and that there may be temptations from the governments to go down. And then I think Mario later also says that, of course, they may go down when all industry is decarbonizing uh, at, at, at a farther stage. And of course, there is less demand then for, for allowances. Of course, that, that might be. And in that case, it is also important to keep prices up because that is the only way in which an inventor can recoup the uh the benefits of his invention of this new technology so so i think again uh we need to keep this incentive to to try to keep prices as at a reasonable level now is a dynamic strike price something that ensures that um i'm not sure it's absolutely necessary uh i think dynamic strike prices uh may be interesting in some cases it depends on the characteristics of the evolution of the market but but i think again essentially uh, a strike price needs to be predictable needs to be uh, certain and so if by dynamic we mean that it can be escalated to account for higher prices in the market that's fine but in the end it's all the same the thing is uh, if we set a uh, a, a certain strike price, what we need to understand is what is going to be the difference with the average expected price over that time period. And, and that is the hedging part. And everything else we do, besides from indexing, which is another thing, of course, indexing is a different thing. But dynamic is, well, uh, I think a less important element, although, of course, it can be considered. And in fact, I think we mentioned it in the, in the report. Thank you very much for your detailed answer. And then I still have a, a question um, to Axel Eggert from uh, Federico Sibaya. Uh, I would like to read. He's asking, can CCFDs support the switch from blast furnaces to scrap-fed electric arc furnaces, and could they help increase scrap supply? So maybe you have an answer to that as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, actually, we have a, a number of uh, projects um, where we switch over from blast furnace to direct reduced iron and EIF technology. Uh, this uh, technology um, uh, allows us to use more steel scrap uh, in the process. At the same time, it allows us to switch over from co coking coal uh, to hydrogen. Um, and from that perspective, uh, I think, yes, uh, that is um, the, the way how, how this can be uh, done. The, the problem which we have as uh, European steel industry uh, is that um, a lot of the scrap which is collected in Europe is being exported. We are talking about 24 million tons of steel scrap every year. Uh, we recycle. 100% of the steel scrap coming back to the industry in Europe, but a lot is being exported. We need more 
And um, you are currently discussing the waste shipment regulation in the European Parliament. And I think the Parliament makes some progress with that respect because it's actually absurd that we have very high environmental standards for our treatment facilities for, uh, for the industry which is re receiving uh, the steel scrap. But um, outside uh, the EU, the standards are much lower in many cases, not in all, but in many cases. And uh, therefore, it must be secured that there is also a level playing field uh, that only those uh, installations outside the EU receive scrap from the EU, which meet uh, also those standards. That would allow us also to keep some of the scrap here in Europe, which is uh, bitterly needed to achieve our uh, objectives, climate objectives. I hope I have answered the question with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, and actually, I'm very, um, I'm very happy today that uh, we talk here in this webinar on uh, CCFDs as well on aspects on the Chips Act. Of course, I'm currently working on that in the ETRI committee as well, and uh, also on the raw materials issues in general because this is very relevant for us in, in that context as well, in the industry context and greening the industry as well, of course. But uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, we still have in the chat a question as well to Mr. Paco. And it would be in German, so uh, maybe you would like to activate the translation button before to uh, hear it adequately, because I will read it in German now. Because Peter Selm Selmke is asking a question, and I will read it in German. Offensichtlich ist die Ausschreibungsmethode eine gute Kombination aus Subvention und marktwirtschaftlichem Wettbewerb. Was aber geschieht nach der Wahl des besten Betriebs mit den anderen? He is asking. Und dann fragt er noch, wie werden die Kontrollen funktionieren zur korrekten Vertragstreue? Dear Mr. Paco, maybe you have an answer to that as well. Yes, I think uh, I got it right, I hope in English. Um, yes, I think these are, these are good questions. And uh, Regarding uh, this, this, I would say, legal elements, we also are working very hard on, on having draft contracts, uh, which will be actually uh, published uh, and uh, subject to, to, to public consultation. Um, and here we are also looking very closely to what is happening in the UK, but also in Germany, because indeed, uh, to define very precisely in these uh, in these contracts uh, how to determine uh, all these, these questions uh, on, on, on the design and, and the operation and the implementation of the auctions is, is absolutely critical. So I don't think I'm in at the, at the position to tell you in detail how it will look like because we are still looking at it, but we will consult uh, very broadly on this point because uh, we, we, we realize the importance, uh, the importance of it. So um, I would say, yeah, please follow closely what we will be uh, publishing on our website. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to add uh, personally as well a, a question that would be interesting. But actually, I've just seen that Christian Bernard had the same in mind. So I will read uh, his one. He's asking, um, how can SMEs profit from this instrument? And are SMEs in the focus of the Commission when it comes to CCFDs? That is an interesting one as well. So maybe uh, you have thoughts on that too. So how SMEs could, could benefit from such program? I think we have there to look at the, I would say the, the broader perspective, uh, if we manage to develop uh, a truly you know, uh, value chain for producing, for instance, uh, green hydrogen or green steel, uh, or green chemicals, uh, this really means that the whole value chain, including SMEs uh, will have to transform um, and uh, will also have to, I would say, benefit from such a transformation. So it might be that SMEs will not directly benefit for such instruments, but indirectly by creating an environment uh, which is uh, truly, I would say, um, aligned with the transition towards climate neutrality. Uh, we will also support, I would say, uh, also the, the, the suppliers uh, in the industry. Um, and I was very recently, for instance, uh, discussing with a supplier of a component of, an el of electrolysis. Uh, so they might not be directly available for, uh, I would say, a support in, in CFD or for grants under the Innovation Fund, but they are part 
partnering together with, let's say, larger projects. Um, so we see very much uh, happening uh, truly integrated projects which uh, look at the whole value chain. And I think this is something that we very much uh, would say support. So I would say indirectly, yes, we will be able to support uh, SMEs. Thank you very much. Um, and I also have a question myself to uh, Mr. Pedro um, Linares uh, again. Um, from Maybe you should um, somehow for, to, to, to answer that question, uh, leave a little the scientific perspective, but maybe this is just not possible because it, this is your expertise. But from what you have heard today in this discussion, would you think that political actors and the industry go in the right direction, that it is fast enough? And do you think that we will get uh, the transformation required um, with the help of the CSFDs. Are you optimistic on that? Or what is your um, estimation when you uh, were a part and listening of that discussion? Thanks. Um, well, thank you for the question. I, I, I think it falls a bit outside scientific expertise, right? It's more, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, first I, I would like to say that I'm, 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 a, I'm an op optimistic person. So I always think that we're going to make it. And uh, by listening to the representatives of industry and uh, from the commission and also the other parties involved, my optimism is reinforced. I think everybody's uh, rowing in the same direction. And I think that's very important that we are all convinced of what we need to do. Now, um, a couple of elements here. First, as I already mentioned, I think CCFDs are only part of the picture, right? So of course there are an essential element to provide certainty to industry, but we cannot just rely on CCFDs or the innovation fund to put another example, to drive this transformation. We need much more, right? And uh, so, so we need to keep working also in all the other instruments. And the CBAM is one of those that is currently being discussed. And But we also need other instruments that will help industry transform and, and become what we really want to have, right? And that includes also innovation policy, for example, right? Uh, so, so I think that's a, a, an important comment. And um, about the speed, uh, I think that uh, also, uh, speed is a concern here moreover given the crisis we are living right and here a concern that we have been discussing with it on platform is that at least in some countries industry has been left as a non-priority issue for example in many national energy and climate plans industry has been left for okay uh, uh after 2030 and i think that's not the right approach i think we need to start right now so uh, so I think it's good that we're having these discussions uh, in order to show that we need to to have these policy instruments as soon as possible, because we need to start the transformation of industry now if we actually want to arrive at net neutrality in 2050. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this very great uh, exchange and discussion with all of you uh, with, on a rather niche topic, I have to say, but on the other hand, uh, a topic that nevertheless can move a lot on EU policy level and serves as a real incentive for the industry to achieve the climate goals via, via the Green Deal. And we all know that CCFDs can support positively the EU industry to be able to compete globally and sustainable to secure millions of jobs in the 27 member states. And um, we would be glad, uh, dear Pedro, if you allow us to send out the power presentation uh, to the audience um, and the panelists if requested. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, dear audience at home as well on the screens. We have seen that uh, most of them stick with us till the very end. So that's wonderful because um, it was very interesting. And thank you so much for your time and hope we will continue that discussion uh, and looking forward to it. Thank you so much for being with us and for your expertise. Thank you and see you soon again in a webinar or on a personal basis. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.